Welcome back everyone. In today's video, we're diving into a powerful book called Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg. If you don't know Sheryl, she used to be Facebook's or Meta's COO up until last year. As someone who has personally worked in the male-dominated industry, which is technology, I can relate to the challenges and the triumphs shared in this book. I read this four years ago. I was at Kinukunia here in Sydney and I thought, Reading the subtitle, Women, Work, and the Will to Lead, I wanted to grab a copy. Now you can buy this at Amazon for 20 bucks, but I wanted to revisit this in light of recent experiences. So the book has 10 chapters. I'm going to zone into four of them, which is sit at the table, stop doing it all, make your partner a real partner, and seek and speak your truth. Let's dive right in. Imagine a Monday morning, you walk into a boardroom where a group of 10 to 15 colleagues gather weekly. On the right side of the room, there's a large TV screen and a board. Chairs are arranged all the way to the back and around the table. Now let me ask you this, which seat would you naturally go for? Would you be inclined to choose a seat towards the back, blending into the crowd? Or do you confidently walk towards the front, ready to make your presence known? The answer to this seemingly simple question holds great significance, especially in a male-dominated industry like tech. The first key point I wanted to talk about is sitting at the table. Women have a tendency to sit at the back or in the middle, but rarely in front. Imagine you're in the cinema or a stand-up comedy, male or female, we typically want to sit in the VIP area if we can afford it or if it's available. Why don't we do the same thing at work? I remember when I was younger, I would grab a seat farthest from where the action was because I didn't have a lot of experience then. I felt that I wouldn't have a lot of contributions to give. I remember in Victoria University of Wellington, a class of 60 students taking computer science, only three of us were females. So I remember for the most part, I was sitting in the back or in the middle. Fast forward 15 years in the industry, I've worked for seven different companies, about 11 different bosses, all males by the way, I still find myself sitting at the back or in the middle unless I'm the one running the meeting. Whether that was because I didn't feel confident or that I doubted my ideas would be valued by the team, especially when I was younger, or perhaps because I was raised to be nice and to put others before myself. And that's mostly the reason these days. Speaking of being nice, there's a book called Nice Girls Still Don't Get the Corner Office by Louise Frankel. The book was an eye-opener for me. There are behaviors that women grow up with, and I did as well, but these little things can sabotage our careers. I highly recommend the book. I may do a video on that in the future, but I want to share a recent experience of a female colleague about being nice. Earlier this year, I was asked by a global women ERG to help host a women's panel for International Women's Day 2023 for the Asia-Pacific region. So I sent out an email to all the females in the office asking for panelist volunteers. The first email that I received from a female colleague reads, Hi Nicola, happy to be a panel member if you don't get a lot of volunteers. If you get lots of volunteers, then feel free to prioritize them. I thought this was contradictory. She was the first to offer help, but said she was okay to be deprioritized if others wanted to do it. It was very interesting. She was proactive when it comes to offering help, yet she was passive when it comes to being selected. Jordan Peterson from the book 12 Rules for Life rightly asks, why are we so good at looking after others instead of ourselves? We even look after pets, but not ourselves. Now I'm not gonna share why he thinks we do this as human beings, I'll save that for another video. But here's the truth coming back to the question of where you sit in a meeting. We need to challenge those stats as women and claim our rightful place at the table. Men do this well. I mean, kudos to them, but most of the women don't. Sheryl Sandberg emphasizes that by choosing a seat closer to where the action is, we send a powerful message. We are here, we are capable, and we have valuable contributions to make. To the men in the room, I believe most of you do this well. If you truly want to work towards equality, one favor I'd love to ask from you is if you have women in your team who sit at the back, Give them the airtime. Proactively seek their thoughts and opinion because female or male, it's usually the quiet who think first before they speak. And when you do ask, you may be surprised with the insights they bring to the table. (music) 
So why do we do it all? I see this in a lot of women, including myself. But as someone who grew up as eldest of four kids, I think I'm pretty responsible. If you're familiar with the strengths finder of Gallup, one of my top five is responsibility. So I've always been pretty independent. I hate relying on people. But as a consequence, even though I grew up to be a responsible kid, I didn't learn how to push back. I was good at saying yes and understanding people, but not really at giving a no. Harvard Business Review has written an article last year that has made it to my bookmarks titled, Are You Taking On Too Many Non-Promotable Tasks or NPTs? It starts with a story of a female intern saying yes to everything, but when it came to the performance review, she wasn't given a promotion because all the tasks she did were what we call NPTs or non-promotable tasks, tasks that weren't high value, administrative and not visible to others. So why do we say yes to these tasks? Harvard says it may be because we are flattered to be us. This hits me like a ton of bricks. The project seems so difficult, no one can do it, so you feel flattered that they've come to you for it. Ladies, please do not fall for this trap. I mean, if these are high value projects, one that drives the company's mission, then by all means work on it, or even if you can lead it, go for it. But if they can be done by someone else, push back. I've had to learn this the hard way. When you get really good at a certain task, people come to you to get the job done. You become a super trusted resource. You become a clutch. And you develop confidence because you know that you can get the job done faster and better. But this is the start of burnout. You get all these work requests, you get tired, and people get so used to it that there's no recognition anymore because that has been your standard. And this isn't just negatively affecting you, it also does for others. It limits others the opportunity to grow. Push back and delegate it to someone junior, you actually are giving them the opportunity to grow. Cheryl talks about the Tiara Syndrome coined by the founders of Negotiating Women, where we expect that if we keep doing our job well, someone will notice us and place a tiara on our heads. Now, this is idealistic. I mean, in a perfect world, this is how it should be. But unfortunately, in all the companies that I've worked for, this is not reality. Cheryl shares that women should not wait for the tiara, and I cannot agree more. We should instead take risks, choose growth, challenge yourselves, and ask for promotions. On promotions, here's an interesting fact from Hewlett Packard, HB, about open job listings that are also advertised to their own employees. The internal report revealed that women only apply for open jobs if they think they meet 100% of the criteria listed. Men apply if they think they meet 60% of their requirements. This difference has a huge ripple effect. Cheryl says women need to shift from thinking I'm not ready to do that to thinking I want to do that and I learn by doing it. So back to the myth of doing it all. If I can add recommendations to what Cheryl has shared, these are awesome books to get. Measure what matters. This ensures that the ladder you're climbing gets you to the right destination. The four disciplines of execution, it also tells you what the difference is between leading measures and lagging measures and everyone gets so fixated measuring the lagging measures when in fact we should be measuring the leading measures. And then third, nice girls don't get the corner office. I spoke about this earlier. Stop being nice and actually do the work. And then one last advice, find a male mentor. Now I'm not saying not to find a female mentor, by all means do it if you can find them because they're rare, at least in my industry. But I've been lucky to have had male mentors who genuinely wanted to help me in my career. And all of them, including my husband, were the ones who kept telling me to push back and remind myself that some of those tasks others should really be doing and not myself. This is probably my favorite one and I'll tell you why in a bit. But I had to leave a previous company for a much better opportunity and I wanted to help them find a replacement. I knew of someone who wasn't in a senior role yet but I thought she was ready for the role I was leaving so I gave her a call. After talking about the opportunity, her response to me was the role sounded super exciting, but she didn't think she was ready. So I tried reassuring with her that when I stepped on this role before, I also thought that I wasn't ready. And as expected, my performance in the first few months was not great. I made mistakes, but equally, I learned so much that on reflection, I do it again because those early mistakes was what pushed me to grow fast. 
And then she said to me that if she wasn't pregnant, she would be taking it on. But because she is, she didn't think it was time to be stepping up with all the new responsibilities she will now have to take on at home. I didn't have the wise words then, so I gave up and she let go of the opportunity. Also, I don't have kids, so I didn't feel credible to be giving any advice to any women who are becoming mothers. And then I read Sheryl Sandberg's book and one of my light bulb moments was the fact that mothers who work are asked, how do you balance life and work about being a mother? And yet fathers aren't asked the same question. Why is that? I mean, is childcare and home chores only for the females? Now I know COVID and remote working has slightly changed this. I've had male colleagues tell me that they didn't realize how much work it is to be at home and to be looking after chores. So with COVID, they actually realized and contributed more at home, so that's great. But this point is super important. Make your partner a real partner. Cheryl says, I truly believe that the single most important career decision that a woman makes is whether she will have a life partner and who that partner is. I don't know of one woman in a leadership position whose life partner is not fully, and I mean fully, supportive of her career. No exceptions. Of the 28 women who have served as CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, 26 were married, one was divorced, and only one had never married. Many of these CEOs said they could not have succeeded without the support of their husbands, helping with their children, the household chores, and showing a willingness to move. On a personal note, I am super lucky to have a very supportive husband and this is why this is my favorite. All of my friends and close colleagues know how supportive my husband is and I can say that without a doubt, my achievements, I owe it to my husband's support and mentorship. Though it's awkward to call him a mentor. He has filled that role for the last 13 years without him probably thinking about it. So for the males watching, make it a true partnership with your wife, please. You also need to sit at the table and as Cheryl says, at the kitchen table. I'm not going to pretend at all that I am an expert in this. In fact, this is an area that I'm still working on. People who know me well and including those I've reported into know that if something bothers me, I tend to keep it to myself until the issue becomes big enough. But by that time, the issue becomes too big to handle. But I find this issue applies to a lot of women. I have friends who have been called unkind words at work, but they didn't and still haven't called out those behaviors. But when they tell me these stories... They are horrifying, but it's disappointing at the same time, like they should have been called out then and there. I know, easier said than done. But why do women find it so easy to tell their friends about what happened, but find it near impossible to call those bad behaviors or say your point of view and in the moment? Sandberg says that when psychologists study power dynamics, they find that people in lower power positions are more hesitant to share their views and often hedge their statements when they do. This helps explain why for many women, speaking honestly in a professional environment carries an additional set of fears. Fear of not being considered as a team player, fear of seeming negative or nagging, fear that constructive criticism will come across as just plain old criticism, fear that by speaking up we will call attention to ourselves, which might open us up to attack, a fear brought to us by that same voice in the back of our head that urges us not to sit at the table. So how do we deal with this? One of the things that Sandberg shares that she learned from Fred Kaufman, author of Conscious Business, is that effective communication starts with the understanding that there is my point of view, my truth, and someone else's point of view, his truth. Rarely is there one absolute truth. So people who believe that they speak the truth are very silencing of others. When we recognize that we can see things only from our own perspective, we can share our views in a non-threatening way. Another takeaway from Cheryl on this topic is that when you give feedback, less is always more. Simple language, directness to the point, as opposed to beating around the bush, which is often the case at work. The problem is people try to hedge, especially when they are providing feedback to someone more senior than them. So the message is filled with caveats and the substance is lost. But if I can add to Cheryl's recommendations based on my experience, seek advice. Seek advice from a trusted friend, 
or peer, seek advice from a mentor, and seek advice from someone who you believe thinks differently from you. Thank you for sticking around. If you like this video, don't forget to smash that subscribe button. And if you want to dive deeper into some of the books I mentioned, check out the links below. And if you are a female in the tech industry and have further thoughts on this video, please leave a comment. And kudos to the men and women for supporting one another and working towards equality in the industry.